Hello everyone, it's 10 o'clock sharp here in the Netherlands, so we're going to start with today's well webinar. Welcome. My name is Eric Neveld, co-founder and CEO of technologycatalog.com, the leading technology platform for the energy transition. In November last year, we announced the winners of the Tech for the Energy Transition Awards 2021. And our motivation for organizing these awards was to highlight the role of technology in achieving net zero. There were five award categories, and in today's webinar, we give the five winners, as well as the other 10 finalists, the opportunity to pitch their technology. And by the way, for those who didn't make it to the finals last year, we going to organize another award competition this year, and more details will be announced sometime in the middle of this year. Before I move to the first category, a few practicalities. For each category, we will first do the pitches of the finalists with six minutes per company. This is then followed by a brief Q&A session. And if you have any questions, you can type them in in the Q&A box that you see on your left-hand side. And in case there's not enough time to address your question, then I would like to encourage you to contact the supplier directly. And an easy way to do that is to go to the technology page on technologycatalog.com and to type in your question in the public form. The webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link after the webinar and feel free to share the link with your colleagues. So welcome everyone again for the final part of this uh, webinar. So last but not least, uh, maintenance, the fifth category. So the cost of maintenance is a significant part of uh, OPEX. And by optimizing maintenance, OPEX can be reduced, making renewables projects more economic. And it's also important to add that many maintenance technologies that are of relevance to renewables projects are already in use in conventional industries. For example, maintenance technologies for operating a hydrogen plant are not fundamentally different from maintenance technologies that we need in refineries. And that's just one example. We can give many examples of things already in use in oil, gas, steel industry, et cetera, that could also apply to wind and other renewables projects. And part of the energy decision is also to make sure that all the relevant expertise in conventional industries is used in the best possible way in renewables, this way accelerating the energy transition. For this, so for this reason, we included maintenance as one of the categories. And with that, I would like to hand over to the first uh, speaker uh, from Reliasol, also the winner of this category. And the winner is uh, was um, yeah, Reliasol, and the speaker is Casper Huisman. So Casper, over to you. Thanks, Henrik. And just to be sure, can you hear me well? Yeah, can hear you loud and clear. Oh, perfect. Okay, well, thanks. And uh, of course, I wanted to start by thanking uh, Technology Catalog again for selecting us as uh, as the winner. Um, we truly had some great response uh, and interest uh, from other companies uh, after the award ceremony and uh, and the announcement. So that has been has been fantastic. Um, my name is Kasper Huisman, and uh, at Reliasol we have developed an AI-based platform for predictive and prescriptive maintenance. And um, in the next couple of minutes, what I will do is I will show you how this helps our customers not only to improve their maintenance, but also how it addresses safety issues and helps them to reduce their carbon footprint. Next slide, please. So um, when we talk to new customers, the starting point often is that we are asked to, uh, to help them with their increasing maintenance costs, uh, rise of downtime costs, or how these issues make them miss their productivity goals. And I guess that these are also the topics for which you kind of expect that a company like us is uh, being called to the rescue. However, what we also see is that with more and more of our customers, the health, safety, and uh, environmental departments become part of the conversations we have with them. And that's because their deliverables are also a very important part of the business case or maybe the return on investment of a company when they are considering to implement predictive or prescriptive maintenance. Next slide, please. So, uh, well, being an AI company, uh, obviously that means that we believe that AI is a part of the solution to address these issues. But I guess that the emphasis here is on part of the solution, because we also know that for many companies, uh, they have experienced that trying to do something with AI, as they typically call it, can also be a problem in itself, because it means that they need to get into completely new territory. 
And uh, for us, that means that it's very important that three essential elements work together. So first of all, yes, it's our proprietary AI engine, uh, which is a fundamental part of, uh, of the solution. But it doesn't stop there because the domain knowledge is equally important. And that is because you really need to bridge that famous or perhaps infamous IT OT gap to make sure that you end up with a solution that actually works. Um, but also that delivers an outcome for the process. I was talking about the, the different elements and the, the last one that I wanted to mention is the, the third element, which consists of working together with the experts uh, within a customer organization throughout the entire project cycle. And then it really depends on the readiness of the customer. So both organizational, but also when they are looking into their own data availability, when we can start a position and how we start that position. So next slide, please. So um, today uh, I'm going to talk specifically about how we help uh, these type of companies to reduce their carbon footprint. So uh, what I want to uh, take a look at is uh, a case we did for Group Asolti, who are the largest chemical company in, uh, in Poland. And also here, just like I mentioned on the first slide, we started discussions with them to solve an immediate reliability issue. And in this case, it was to help them to re uh, uh, with random vibrations for a gas turbine. And what we did is we uh, performed root cause analysis and uh, following that we installed a predictive maintenance system that allows them to monitor in real life or sorry in real time but also to prevent uh, downtime resulting from these uh, random vibrations and specifically this means that we were able to detect that actually the cause of the problems came from two building blocks away from the actual turbine and that the vibrations were simply passed on through piping to the turbine causing it to, uh, to trip. And now our installed system allows them to take early enough actions to prevent the turbine from tripping. Um, however, uh, with them, this was only the starting point in our relationship because then they asked us to help them in minimizing their gas consumption. And we did that by creating a digital twin of the reforming process that they have. And uh, that allowed the project team to optimize the reforming process because we could change the control uh, parameters and then the digital twin, it uh, divided the reform process into different stages. And each of these stages had an input, an output, and a control variable. And um, in the end, the adopted modeling that we had did not only allow our customer to gain more insight about the process itself, but also um, the optimization algorithm provided them with a solution that uh, led to a, a hydrogen consumption reduction of 1.35 percent and with the amounts that we are talking about with these type of processes that means that you're talking about millions of savings and then the return on investment is not years it's not months but you're talking about weeks so uh, if you then look into the customer journey for group Asalti, you see that also with them we started to work with them first to solve an immediate problem and then um, after we achieve those results, we let, that led to further improving their uh, processes with also these very tangible results, both from an environment, but also from a business case perspective. Next slide, please. So um, in summary, this means that our solution helps our customers to well avoid, optimize, reduce, decrease, extend, uh, minimize uh, where that is needed. And that leads to direct or sometimes indirect, but um, in any case, very tangible results for their energy transition. And that is because we can, with these things, ensure that uh, production processes can continue. We prevent ramp up insufficiencies. Uh, we can make sure that there's no equipment failures that simply directly endanger the environment. As I've shown, uh, we can optimize processes. We can extend the machine lifespan so you don't need to replace them as often. And also we can uh, prevent excessive energy consumption or emissions due to uh, poor asset quality. And uh, depending on the customer's needs, we offer that in the form of our platform or also our brand new uh, Arsens apps, as you can see on the right. Next slide, please. Um, well, in the, in the end, there's a lot that I cannot say in, uh, in five or six minutes, but uh, some things to keep in mind are our uh, super fast implementation time because we simply have automated a lot more than uh, the solutions which are out there. Uh, it's also our industry-leading accuracy and uh, scalability. 
and uh, also that we're well, a very fast growing company. And uh, as we see today, we're a proud winner of, uh, of multiple uh, awards. So thank you for your time. Many thanks, Casper, uh, and apologies for uh, that uh, small hiccup. So for the next presentation, actually, we need to, to switch to a different PowerPoint file, and we tried to already get it ready in the background, but we pressed the wrong button. But uh, hey, That's great, okay, pres no great presentation. And as we uh, start to uh, get the next uh, presentation up, uh, I really like the examples that you, uh, you showed and also uh, indeed highlighting that uh, optimizing maintenance uh, can also give many other benefits at the same time. And so uh, great uh, overview. And while we get the next presentation up, I want to handle one comment that came up in the, uh, the Q&A box, a comment or question. Uh, whether we can run a webinar, host a webinar about renewables materials for the industry. That's certainly something we will put on the, uh, the list. So the next presentation is, uh, is up. And the next presentation is uh, from Peter Maidman from Clean Subsea, all the way from Australia. So it's getting later already. Peter, over to you. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank yourself and uh, Technology Catalog for giving us this opportunity. Um, obviously, congratulate uh, the team at Reliasol for a, a, a very strong win. Um, and also congratulations to Valve Type for their participation as well. Obviously, a strong field of com competition this year. Um, we're an Australian-based uh, um, company that has uh, invented, in, in very brief terms, an underwater vacuum cleaner. Um, that protects marine biodiversity um, and also go, gives huge step towards reducing the um, fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions of ships. So to give that some context, uh, next slide, please. So for those who are people who aren't necessarily familiar, uh, you get a lot of marine growth accumulating on ships' hulls whether they're in transit or in port. And as that marine growth builds up, as you can see in that, that top right picture, that actually causes the, uh, the drag on the vessel's hulls to dramatically increase. And I think anyone with an engineering or physics background will, will know that uh, as that friction increases, the, the force required to propel through the water uh, goes up exponentially. Um, and as the graph on the, uh, the bottom right shows, which actually comes from one of um, the uh, International Marine Agencies, uh, the IMO, um, as the uh, amount of marine growth on the ship's hull increases, um, you can get up to nearly 200% increased fuel consumption and obviously corresponding uh, increased greenhouse gas emission. So the robot that we've developed and, and designed um, is, uh, designed for cleaning all of that marine growth off the ship's hull to, to bring the greenhouse gas emission back down, um, but also to ensure it is completely captured and contained so that when we're doing this cleaning, none of that marine growth or the actual coating, which uh, has been a subject of a few uh, earlier presentations, the actual coating from the ship's hull does not pollute the uh, sea environment as well. So next slide, please. The system that we've uh, invented consists of two main parts. Uh, the first part that you can see there is the actual robot uh, that cleans the ship's hull. Now, this can either be operated by a diver, uh, as you will see in a short video next, or it uh, is capable of being completely remotely operated from the surface to remove the risk to divers. Uh, it uses a, a very innovative uh, cleaning blade system um, most tools of this variety use uh, abrasive brushes, which can damage the and remove the uh, coating from the hull. Uh, but our innovative technology makes sure there is no damage to the ship's hull and the paint paint on it. Next slide, please. If you can just activate the video, I was hoping it would run a bit smoother than this. Um, this is actually in diver operated mode. Um, but I think you can get the general impression. Um, the robot runs up and down ship's hulls, uh, cleaning as it goes along. 
and all of that marine growth that's removed is pumped back up to the surface to the, the second part of our system. And I think given the time, we can skip ahead to the next slide, please. So the second part of our system is a, a three-stage filtration process uh, that the water containing marine growth that has come up from the uh, underwater is fully filtered uh, down to 10 microns, which is uh, in line with upcoming international standards. Um, so that the water that it then returns to the sea is completely clean. So all the marine growth is removed, all of the particulate material, uh, the bits of uh, coating uh, from the ship's hull, if any of that has been absorbed by the marine growth, all of that is removed and clean water is then returned to the ocean. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this is a video of, of the actual filtration in action. Obviously, this contribution towards the shipping industry reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, will have a huge impact. Um, I think at the last estimate, um, there was in the region of up to $30 billion um, that could be saved by reducing fuel consumption and obviously the environmental benefit of the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is, is enormous. Um, in the same way that, for example, the automotive industry has become a lot more regulated and a lot more environmentally friendly over, I would say, our lifetimes, we can expect that to be introduced to um, uh, maritime vessels, marine vessels. And this obviously covers, this is the type of equipment that we, can be used on anything. Uh, our main jobs are with naval vessels in Australia, but we're expanding into international markets for bulk shipping, container ships, um, offshore marine oil and gas, cruise liners. All of these ships can benefit from that uh, reduced fuel consumption, corresponding reduced carbon footprint and reduced greenhouse gas emission. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, first off, you can all hear me, I hope. No, okay, clear. Right, I see some nodding heads, so that's good. Um, and also thank you for the two presenters before me from Will Asol and, and Clean Sub Sea for their uh, informative presentations as well. And uh, as you mentioned, indeed, a strong field of competition for this category. So uh, no shame in losing uh, to Will Asol, I think. Uh, first off, my name is uh, Dan Punt. I'm the operations coordinator at Valve Tides. Uh, we're a company based in, uh, in Wersloor, the Netherlands, uh, and operationally active since uh, 2016. Uh, we are the inventor and uh, producer of the double block and bleed saver, DBB saver in short, uh, which allows for a safe working behind passing valves. If you move on to the next slide. Uh, first off, what do we define as a leakage? Um, this is when valves are passing beyond the acceptable leak rate, uh, which is zero. Uh, when valve repair results in an unacceptable outage or it's just not practically possible, uh, and then what are your current options? Uh, the first one would be boundary isolation and depressurization uh, further upstream. However, this is often resulting in a, in a major outage of a, a plant or pipeline. Second option would be to postpone uh, the plant maintenance work, also not preferred for most um, pipeline and plant operators. A third option. Uh, Often is injecting grease or sealants. Uh, however, leakage uh, can reappear suddenly when injecting grease or sealants, and this can cause a sudden uh, blow through. Uh, a final option would be accepting the leakage risk as it is and using uh, conventional risk mitigation. However, people then need to rely on PPE and gas detection, for example, uh, which should normally only be used as a last line of defense. Uh, and moreover, with this uh, option, you have to take into, into consideration then that um, how do you define what is your maximum acceptable leak rate? Uh, and moreover, how can you measure uh, the leak rate safely? And for toxic media with, uh, for example, H2S, how can you measure the leak rate at all uh, during the works? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the valve type DBB server makes a safe working downstream possible by connecting to the bleed section in a classical double block and bleed, uh, as can be seen in, in below picture. And by imposing a negative pressure difference uh, into that section, between two valves, uh, absolutely zero passing to the safe work area uh, is guaranteed uh, by reversing the flow direction over the second valve. Um, however, it's not only applicable to a classical double, bleed, double block and bleed, uh, as we can see in the next slide as well. 
uh, in a single valve isolation, also we can create a negative pressure difference, uh, but then between the two seats in a single valve. Uh, this will then reverse flow over the second seat and again making leakage towards the safe work area um, yeah, basically impossible. Uh, next slide, please. With the DBB saver, um, there are several major advantages. Uh, first one is also the most important one. Safety is maximized by adding several layers of protection. Uh, amongst others are mitigating the leakage of the first block file seat, uh, being able to prove the bleed con continuously online, fail safe, and thereby minimizing the risk of human failure. Uh, and relying, relaying alarms to the control room and or the safe work area, um, thereby being able to inform personnel directly uh, and um, yeah, immediately. Uh, the remaining risk is as low as reasonably uh, possible and lower than ever before. Uh, also, the DUB saver, uh, with the DUB saver, you are able to maximize plant availability, availability uh, since the platform or pipeline uh, can stay in production, uh, also resulting in minimal gas loss and gas emissions. And furthermore, there is a significant cost reduction because execution of maintenance work uh, can be according to planning without any delays. Um, and there is less necessity for expensive valve repairs or uh, valve maintenance. Um, over to the next slide, please. Uh, so basically, in short, this means that with the valve type DVB saver, uh, we can create a new level of safe isolation uh, when creating a double block and vacuum. Um, of course, um, positive isolation is always one step safer than a proven isolation, but often to install positive isolation, um, first, you have to have some form of proven isolation. Um, and this can also be achieved with valve type DVB saver. And thus being the highest achievable safety level of isolation using those valve, uh, those valves, uh, with applicability in not only the oil and gas but also in, in upcoming sectors such as uh, hydrogen, uh, we are also ready for the energy transition. Um, thank you for your attention, and I hope this uh, gives a, a good short overview of the DUB zero. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, to answer them in the in the upcoming. Uh, a q a and also uh, invite you to visit uh, our linkedin or our website halftype.com thank you again many thanks uh, dan and we have a couple of minutes for q a i see some questions uh, coming in and let me start with uh, uh, one here let's start with one for clean sub c does clean sub c envisage a diver free system one day I probably skipped through the presentation so quickly that that didn't come up, but our system is uh, capable of being fully remotely operated. Uh, so it can be run completely uh, remotely from the surface um, with eliminating the risk of, of having divers in the water. That That is the system that we have developed since the one that you mentioned seeing at AOG, um, and that is currently in production. Yeah, the one I saw at AOG is uh, quite a while ago, so that's uh, three years back. So, and it's great to see the uh, the progress since that time. And thanks for sharing that uh, that overview. And uh, so let's uh, go to a question for uh, for Relia Sol. What industry sector presents the biggest opportunity for Relia Sol? Um, well, there, there, there's two ways to uh, to look at that. So I think that traditionally, if you look into predictive maintenance, then it's it's it it is typically about the cost of downtime. So where the cost of downtime is high, uh, such as the chemical industry, uh, oil and gas, um, uh, then those are the markets where uh, you know uh, people are gonna have a fantastic business case when it comes to um, uh, predictive and prescriptive uh, maintenance. Um, however. Um, and I briefly mentioned that as well during your presentation. We have just uh, introduced a new portfolio, which are called the RSIMS apps, and that is specifically targeted for also smaller types of industries. For, so for companies that say, I want to do something with predictive and prescriptive maintenance. However, we all know it's going to be super small steps. Maybe they don't have the downtime cost or the data availability that you normally need to feed the AI engine for predictive and prescriptive maintenance. So that's where we see also other markets uh, opening up. And then you are talking, for instance, uh, food and beverage, uh, discrete manufacturing, uh, th those types of markets. Okay, yeah, excellent. Actually, another question for you. 
how close are we to use AI for production optimization based on real-time data of consumers' demands? Oh, that's a good, uh, a good question. So real-time data of consumer demand to influence what is then needed for the production side, I guess. Well, I think the short answer uh, uh, here is that if the data is there, then in principle, you can feed it into the engine and you can, <laughs> you, you can build a model um, uh, around it. Uh, I think then the next question is how quickly are you then actually able to really significantly influence your production process uh, for it? So I think that just like with every AI um, uh, project, it's also about the actual practical usability of what you can do with your data and how you can influence your process. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. A question to Felftide. Would Felftide technology be applicable to the geothermal markets? Um, that's a good question, actually. Um, we have been in, in contact with some uh, some uh, steam um, factories as well. Um, and the Valta DUV is applicable to this market. Uh, as to of this date, we did not do any um, uh, maintenance work in that sector yet, um, but it's fully certified and fully applicable uh, to those markets as well. Uh, just as I mentioned, it is, as it is to the hydrogen market, for example. Um, so yeah. That's uh, that's definitely an option we uh, we are open to, and we are also uh, uh, yeah ready for as well. Okay, excellent. So, um, hope uh, I mean I've seen the technology from nearby in the past couple of years, and we, great to see the growth, and hope to see you also expand into other areas. Hope I don't see I don't see any other questions coming in. So with that, I think we can. Uh, wrap up, uh, perhaps some final remarks from one of the three presenters uh, here, just going around the virtual room. Kasper, starting with you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I, actually, it has been said already a, a couple of times, but I would like to, to, to definitely emphasize that indeed when it's about AI for the industry, then you need to take small steps. It's as easy as, uh, as that. Uh, but also what we find is critical is to at an early stage to include all stakeholders so that doesn't mean only what i was talking about within a company so the, the health and safety uh, department actually in the entire value chain so between let's call it the end customer and the vendors they're going to be uh, service providers could be an oem and they are all part of the solution so they're all part of the energy transition so that's what we truly believe is that all those parties you need to bring them on board asap um, to in the end uh, have a successful project. Yeah, excellent. Any final remarks from the other presenters? Peter, starting with you. Yeah, I think what we've seen today, Eric, is is there's such a broad range of companies all over the world um, looking at every, every possible avenue and every possible opportunity to help um, move towards uh, carbon reduction, towards reduced greenhouse gas emission, um, towards sustainable development goals in line with the UN's expectations. There's uh, different initiatives in, you know, all over the world, Norway, Europe, Australia, uh, California was mentioned in one of the previous presentations and, and they tie in very well with what we do in trying to protect the marine biodiversity. So I think what we've seen over the course of today is how, um, how much uh, effort people are willing to put in to move towards these kind of goals and all really work together towards, you know, an overall reduced uh, carbon footprint across so many different industries and so many different platforms. So I think it's it's a, a huge recognition of what, what technology catalog has managed to pull together. Thanks, Peter. Dan, any final comments from you? Well, for me, I think uh, I cannot do anything other than uh, agree with Peter. I think there are a lot of uh, companies uh, ready for the energy transition and also uh, waiting for the energy transition to to kick off even more than it uh, is al has already done. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, um, good for uh, good that a technology catalog is putting uh, so much effort and uh, so much uh, attention to that. Um, so yeah. Hey, thanks for that, and uh, yeah, thanks for all today. So 15 great presentations. And also thanks to all the attendees and hopefully you will leave this webinar with many ideas on how you can improve the performance and realize your goals with technology. And we will continue to create visibility for technologies via the platform, technologycatalog.com, such that companies can find and select the right tech to improve performance.
So with that, many thanks, and I wish you all a great rest of the day.